Uh, I'm Sal Abenanti, and I'm going to be um, running Alex Ross through the ringer on uh, about the uh, murals, the Marvel mural and the new Marvel poster club through Abrams. So, and who are you exactly? I'm my name's Sal Abenanti, and I'm uh, uh, I work with Alex Ross. I'm his, his business rep, and um, we've been partners in crime for a lot of years now in this. And I was brought on to uh, to play David Letterman for today and uh, pick his brain about the creative process of the Marvel mural, which t- got turned into this great poster book. Excellent. And that poster book would be this one in question yes. here, which is what we're trying to draw attention to. Right. So I'm and and Alex... just a little bit of background. It started, the piece started as this, uh, it was a, originally a commission of this enormous mural for the uh, centerpiece of the new Marvel offices on Broadway in uh, on Madison, I'm sorry, in, in New York. And Alex, this is this huge wall outside the conference room. And then it kind of morphed and evolved into these other things. And then eventually this this great uh, poster book. So showed. the initial pitch they brought to you saying would you know would i be yeah the initial pitch it? came from they've just moved into these these great new offices right across the street from radio city music hall which used to be the old rolling stone offices and they're they're they're, they're these great these great shot overlooking uh you know madison and um they've got this huge space near their conference room right in front of their conference room that they wanted to do this enormous mural of all these these classic marvel characters so they said, do you think it would be something Alex would be up for? And I said, well, it's a big project. I mean, that's a lot of, a lot of, you know, it's a lot of work. So let me see where he's at with it. Let me see if the concept, you know. Well, keep in mind, they didn't have any idea of what they wanted other than a mural. So that was it all could have been... Well, originally, I think it was this explosion of characters, kind of a la George Perez, or sure. the, the piece that Claudio Castellini did where it was just this. And then you were just kind of like, well, I'm not crazy about that because now I got to draw a lot of these smaller, you know, you, you know, these certain characters are going to be this big now and I got to draw thousands of them. And I can't, you couldn't really dive into that. As well, actually, as that's a good thing to explain is that basically the art request is not to come in and do art in their offices and create something on the wall you just create a piece of artwork at whatever size is comfortable and they can scan it and blow it up to whatever size that the the room demands so knowing that i knew whatever i wanted to create i still wanted to have a certain kind of control over the presentation and instead of making a composition with figures i might draw at these tiny sizes i'd rather make large figures knowing they're going to get blown up right that at least stand up a little bit better under the scrutiny that's going to be there in person. And that's where I pitched them instead of a composition, a grouping of all these life-size figures that when they're printed out, they'll be life-size. Whereas the artwork was only about two and a half feet tall for each figure. Um, You know, it could achieve that point of, you know, this big impact kind of image. And then we compose this, uh, or I, I designed the piece based around a composition of all the figures standing together, but I did separate paintings for each of the figures so they can be scanned separately, assembled digitally, but used in other media for things like, again, this poster right, right. <laughs> from Avery. And I don't even I don't even really think at the time we thought of it. I think we knew that that was probably down the line, but that really kind of wasn't you know, I don't think it was really in the conversation initially. And then we kind of figured based on when you were saying, look, I want to do these individually. Then I said, yeah, that's great. We can, we can group them. We can separate them. We can scan them in individually and it'll make a much more, uh, it'd be easier to kind of move them around too, I guess. So to speak. Yeah. The downside of course, is a composition like this. If you study it too closely, you you could start to wonder why with the heavy shadow used on the figures that nobody's casting a shadow on one another you know if you've got all these guys standing together shouldn't there be you know this guy's blocking that guy so their shadow should be on top none of that actually matters in this and i don't think anybody is too distracted with it when you see it all assembled but uh right. you know it's it's a trick and i and i think a lot like the marvel the marvel handbook you know the marvel universe handbook 
you know, you've always stated that you didn't think a lot of that stuff was accurate in terms of the proportions of what the Hulk was like standing oh. at the door. Or what? So you were you were hell bent on like no, he's got to be this big compared to when he's standing next to Spider Man and when he's standing, you know, in Colossus, for example. I think the two biggest guys in the in the piece of what Colossus and the Hulk, right? And yeah, so, yeah. Even but the though actual tallest the item guys, is uh, the tallest piece is Silver right. Surfer's board is taller than everything else in the height of it. So just because it's taller than seven, it's like eight feet or something. Right. And even when we were doing the insta, well, I wasn't actually doing the installation, but I was there the, the morning of the installation. You were concerned about, you know, hey, how do they look together? How do they look? You know, is the is Colossus proportioned correctly or did they print it where he looks too small or did they print it to where he's not? You know, because you, you were concerned that, hey, man, if these things are lifelike, I want the Hulk to appear kind of how he would be as if you were standing in front of him. And I think they nailed it, which is good. So you think it looks actually big enough? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, with the exception of, you know, there's about maybe six to eight inches off the floor, but that was something that we felt was important as we were installing it. I was talking to the guys and they were like, look, they mopped these floors. <laughs> well, you know, because it's concrete floors. Yeah. It's got this, this kind of slick looking, you know, Michael Mann office where it's all this concrete. And I don't know if they're going to stay with the concrete, but it's concrete there now. And I, and I said, hey, yeah, you're right. A lot of these these toxic cleaning solvents over time, this stuff's going it, to, it, yeah. it's just made out of, it's not printed to endure outside. It's really just meant to be inside. So we, over time, we don't want it to fade and we don't want it to look bad. So let's, you know, let's go about that high off the floor. And it worked out fine. And the okay. only irony was that the, that they had to cut out the, uh, the fire alarm, the smoke detector and the fire alarm because it was right by the human torch, which was, you know, kind of a, just a weird coincidence. As long as it didn't yeah. cut out a character's head, that's all that matters. Right. No, no. It's just weird that it's like a really kind of like people thought, wow, the irony that the, that the fire alarm is over the human torch. I was like, yeah, well, I, I don't I just lied and said you planned it like that. But, you know, it probably wasn't the case and i don't think they bought it but no the installation turned out great and and actually the photos are in the book in the post yes. book you could see the marble offices yes. <laughs> yeah you could see how it kind of you know the proportion of how they turned out yeah yeah I and mean, then the uh, originals are how big two feet yeah that's the that's the you, you can you kind of see the, like. the and so. of course and but the originals each one is say what two feet Three feet yeah. high with yeah, a little with over trim. two feet for the majority of them. Uh, you know, I got a few crouching figures like Spider Man, Spider Woman that are smaller, but uh, you know, everything was proportionally uh, painted at the same size so that you know there would be consistency amongst the different paintings. And uh, when everything's enlarged, it will be the proper height level for comparing to each person. Right. So um, we should mention with the book. Just that, you know, the <clears throat> the use of the figure shots here is the first time that people are able to see the entire full figures uh, to see what was done. Because otherwise, when we've had them printed at Marvel, uh, they've been variant covers for them, but as a cropped version, as a like a bust up kind of feature. So this usage is the first time that we're getting full um, figures yeah. for each of the we're, uh, shots we're, they're, yeah they're on their own they're they're not grouped and they're not together so it's cool to see them separated like that and now, the thing is, i mean this is i and i don't want to i don't want to i don't you know i don't want to kill you with this but this is inevitably the most asked question so walk us through a little bit about the process of each one or, or a piece when you approach a single character like you lay it out you pencil it and you go right to you know painting or and how long does it take you know, per character, obviously different depending, but that's going to be the question that we get a lot. We get asked a lot. Well, basically I had a sketch for the entire group of figures first. So everything was designed at once. It was all one big group shot with each figure kind of, you know, standing one in front of the other, knowing what the sort of physical relationships were between the different figures. Not that they're so much reacting to each other, but I knew as I might have this guy standing here, Spider-Man was going to be down covering that person's legs because he's crouching on the ground. I had that thought out 
I knew that I'd have kind of Iron Man and Cap somewhat back to back a little bit. Um, so some of the poses reflected their their partners in the scene. But then each figure pulled apart effectively when I'm uh, basically blowing up, copying up the pan pencils to a larger size, that sketch. I'm then tracing off my original pencil to a larger scale. I'm taking photo reference of each individual figure, and then I'm drawing each thing on its own, uh, completing out the entire bodies. If, if they were blocked or covered in some way, I'm finishing out the rest of the bodies. And by taking photos of a live model doing the poses, you get more of the naturalism that exists in the different figure poses. So, um, and as far as one of the questions that I assume comes up, it was based upon characters, the versions that uh, kind of stood the test of time the longest. You know, whenever you've got a new design for a, a particular character, it often might seem to overwhelm the company's attention to push that first. And, you know, this includes like classic looks at the FF or Submariner or, you know, some of these characters seem to never change like Spider-Man, but everybody gets a kind of clothing change at some point. And I was trying to just sort of stick with, this is what's got the, the greatest longevity to it. And these are not necessarily reflective of the influence of what happens in the cinematic universe, because these are kind of two different worlds. There's the publishing world, which is sort of always going to be the guiding light that influences what happens in cinema, but the cinematic stuff doesn't have to dictate what was, you know, what was the classic timeless version of these things. And that's what I tried to do. And what was, now what did you have to state when you were painting them as you were, what was the one thing that had to, that had to show up in all the pieces consistently when you're in terms of your your lighting composition was there a certain were you going for that that end of that dusk or that dawn kind of you know sunlight coming in or that kind of golden light or what were you going for in terms of you know yeah the key thing is um and i might have thought of it based upon a single photo i saw that sort of gave me the inspiration but just putting a heavy dark almost black shadow side on one half of the figure's body and then having a warm light noticeably upon their left side. So all the light is coming from the left in towards them, which ironically, as it would turn out in the conference room or just outside the conference room, there's a set of windows to yeah. the left yeah, uh, coming from where the light source arguably would be on all these figures. So, uh, you know, that black side isn't really too ostentatious, but it was meant to be a reflection of a certain kind of mood that you could apply to looking at the Marvel characters in the way of, if I just did full blown out light on the figures as a whole, uh, it wouldn't probably serve the, the realism as well because it'd give you a lot more to sort of pick away at with my painting. If I give so much light on an object that's like a flash photography shot of it, it really starts to break down how either impressive the figures are. I need to use shadow to amplify drama. And that's a key right. hallmark of my work. And it's certainly done heavily within photography of live actors playing these parts too. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was, it was cool in the sense of, I, I mean, the, the cool thing about the piece was, I think I remember seeing the, the original sketches and it, the piece didn't change very much at all. I mean, with the exception, I think the only thing that changed was that you added some characters. Yeah. Because initially, I don't think Ghost Rider was on the table. I don't think Shang-Chi was on, mm -hmm. was, was going to be in it. And, uh, and I think, and for the book, you added a couple of pieces, right? I mean, they're small, but you added a few additional characters that don't, that don't appear in the mural. Well, the, the gag in the book is that you can see my doing uh, an image of the diminutive characters that don't appear in the poster, which is uh, Ant-Man, Yellow Jacket, and uh, the Wasp, uh, basically showing the fact that if you treat those as in canon characters, they're technically supposed to be the size of ants. They're right. not supposed to be doll sized, which would mean that if I had illustrated them up and then you blow them up for being in the, the piece, uh, they'd be larger than they would be within the context of what these characters are supposed to do. So there's no real reason to have included them if you're going to represent them faithfully or you just have them as life-size people 
which I thought would sort of undercut the whole nature of their power. Yeah. And, and it just seemed, it was cool to, that, you know, because whether, I don't know whether, whether every people know or not, you never want to assume they do that. You did a whole series of these of the DC heroes. What was it? Well, almost 20 years ago, right? I mean, at least that long ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a, a long run of uh, pieces that were initially created for posters and then they got other uses where it was the same thing. We cropped them as bust up shots for posters and then they were seen in full for other media we did with prints and other. Did you ever see them as a whole? Did you ever see it as a, as a grouping, as a character grouping or not really? You just kind of approached them separately. With the DC ones, uh, there was a few that, you know, are kind of the relationship of the figures may reflect one another, like Superman and Batman are designed to kind of be back to back figures. Right. And when I designed the Superman one, it was initially commissioned as a piece for a uh, book stand up. So that it had like these uh, pockets on the side of his cape that you could load up comics into this display cardboard piece. And then I wound up doing the same thing design wise with Batman. So uh, when I came over to do the piece for Marvel, I treated the cap piece as the counterpart to Superman so that if you had the two back to back, Superman's right. back could be up against Captain America. But but now did you was there much thought in terms of, of a different approach to one company versus the other, obviously, because the you know the Warner characters versus the Marvel characters, there's a there's a different dynamic between the two or no? I, I you know, that's where that shadow idea comes in. The idea that it's not so much the characters in Marvel have so much more of a darkness, but that there's maybe there's the presumption of more serious take with them. So the black side of the shadow side of their forms is sort of dramatic pushing beyond just the lighting I did on the DC ones where it was uh, kind of a split lighting thing, light source on either side of their bodies, creating a single bit of shadow in the center. Um, so they were more fully illuminated, whereas the Marvel ones had a single charismatic light source. I just want to know how you managed to pull off the white gloves on a Punisher. You just got to go in there and embrace it, it for what it is. No, you know? I, no, I think it's he does a delicate couple, a job. Lot of the you know, well, I think the the weird thing about the piece is that a lot of them have been shown individually now as covers and as as you know even through the book and through the the, the Marvel Timeless covers. And Punisher just wasn't getting his due for some reason, and he's got this this cult following of fans yeah. that were saying, "Hey, where's the Punisher? Where's where's the Punisher cover? Where's the Punisher cover?" And so. When we released it, uh, right as the book came out, I said, "Look, I don't, I don't want to put it out until we, you know they can see it." Out the people were like, "I don't know how Alex pulled off the white gloves because he hasn't had those white gloves in a long time." Because <laughs> the characters got, you know, he's been, my God, he's had his own. He's had fifteen. You remember in the nineties, he had like five different Punisher books, and they got rid of the gloves right away, and his, they grittied him up for television a lot more. And, and oh yeah, yeah, no, but the Vita outfit works. You know, yeah, there's just bullets. something about I'm not going to redesign a John Romita costume. You know, he's one of the greatest costume designers in comics. And, uh, you know, he made certain choices. Like when you look closely at the uh, the way I do the skull on his chest, the right. teeth were always designed to be a row of bullets. The bullets. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, that's been altered into like they've been everything from like uh, canisters to, you know, their their bullet. Uh, uh, what do you call them? The the chambers you put into the, the gun, right. you know, magazines. I mean, yeah, yeah they're, they're magazines instead of individual bullets. And I've always treated it as, well, no, they, they were meant to be individual bullets, I believe. Right. So they I was work. carefully yeah. trying to draw each one. And they're these super long bullets that I don't know what kind of gun they go into because I don't know guns for nothing. Right. So right. I'm sure I'm, it's, it's almost just a decorative thing. He's not really using the bullets that are on his shirt no. for shooting. And a, lot, and a lot of his guns in the book, back then weren't based on any real guns they were just kind of like whatever gil kane would design or yeah. whatever amita would lay out they would just make it look like a cool gun because the bullets really weren't you know I, it kills me whenever you read comments and they're like oh but how does he get around how does he bend forward with those bullets in, in his stomach and you're like guys it's not supposed to be based on reality <laughs> i mean come on now and, or the choice of the of the ghost rider cycle you know, which is, I think, 
first appearance was from the champions, right? Or before the champions? Uh, I think it, it did premiere in his own book and it was, uh, you know, the second motorbike that he had. So it was right. the first where he had like kind of a front to it that looked like the skull face. It was the skull. Yeah. And I just thought that's a cool looking design. And when they revived the character around 1990, they, um, you know, they kind of brought that back as well in the update. And it just to me, that's symbol, you know, that's a perfect symbol of the character. You got to have yeah. the skull face on the front of the, the bike. I think, I think, you know, it, it surprised some people because I think people were like, wow, why didn't you give him a chopper? Why didn't you give him from, you know, because of the movies and everything else where the, now the tires became flaming and everything else. But I loved it because that, there was something so cool about that bike. Because it almost looked like a, like it was it was designed to make a toy out of it, because you got this guy with a flaming skull, and the front of his bike is this giant skull. Yeah, and there was a toy of it back there in the '70s. Surprisingly, it's one of the oddest things that Ghost Rider actually got a, a toy with a little right. wind up uh, yeah, motorbike. It was, it was now. Was there anybody that that you would? I mean, just for for personal reasons, you would have thrown in that didn't make the cut. Well, the ones I would have thrown in are ones that have more complication to them in terms of how much they're uh, redesigned in contemporary handling. So uh, say like Luke Cage is a great example. Wonderful character, important character historically, but symbolically his design that's memorable is the one with the yellow shirt and the tiara and everything. Right. So when you get rid of all that stuff, he just looks like another guy. You yeah. know, he looks indistinguishable from multiple guys you could run into. And that's part of the iconography of comics is embracing those things that have a certain visual stimulus that come from just the fact that, well, you know, branding, <laughs> you know, right. um, I would have thrown in, say, you know, his partner Iron Fist in, in the same piece, but I definitely would have liked to include the original Nick Fury Um the way he appeared as going from Sergeant Fury into Nick Fury, because that's that's one that gets complicated with the movie version having an outsized impression upon the way they do the comics. They rewrote contemporary comics now to really try and fit what's happening in cinema, but the history of this character for what that comic was in the 60s and the legacy that he has is just one of the things that I would have liked to have shown him. But this this applies to a great many characters that maybe I'll take the time to go and do them separately and then we'll find some use for them. It did, now, the Kirby where he's wearing a suit or the Steranko era? Steranko yeah. era, only because it's almost like it was becoming more its own thing once they were doing the sort of uh, James Bond shield thing. With all it, the pockets? With all yeah. the pockets, yep. Yeah, didn't didn't Cyclops kind of steal that outfit, you know, in the '90s? He did. He did. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and it was it was great that you you know you you got you know you put in the the Kirby you know Black Bolt because that's one of the coolest costumes there is. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, and it's cool that Medusa and some of the ones that that made the cut, you know, kind of surprised me, but I'm glad that they're in here. Shang Chi, I think, was is very cool. That like I and it was this was the pre-movie stuff i mean this was something that you wanted him in there you know it wasn't related to oh he's gonna get a movie coming up we should put shang chi in i mean you wanted him in there before that so well it helps that they knew they were making more use of the character when i was doing the piece just because then they don't have to go like oh why would you pick this old character we don't even publish anymore you know they need to see it as being part of their current uh you know lineup of most important properties so, you know, and I want the piece to be diverse and represent just how uh, how widespread the the panorama of characters and people are that make up the Marvel Universe. You know, it, it was something to sort of pick out everybody and get highlights of certain things, whereas I know I, I can't get in or I just didn't get in everybody's favorites. I mean, if I kept going with the piece, there's a lot of the contemporary stuff, characters that became famous in the last 30 years that wouldn't necessarily be my first choices to get in there because characters that have had more of a footprint over 40 to 50 years, they kind of, you know, they're first in line in my thought. Like they've got that much of a cultural buildup to yeah. be included. And, and I mean, it had to be, it also had to kind of be a hard choice 
you know, just like say for, you know, for instance, Iron Man. I mean, yeah, he has the, the version you use is kind of what I think of as Iron Man. It's almost as close to it's kind of a cross between something we got now and a little bit of a, of a Tusca or a Bob Layton. But, you know, you must have been tempted to throw in, you know, the, the gold guy, you know, one where he's all gold. I mean, just, <laughs> or even this piece, the, I was not tempted to do that. No, no. you wouldn't want to put the silver centurion one in there where no. you know, he, he had the white arms. You know, yeah, and, that's uh, that's that's the one they came out with around the time I went to art school. So I, uh, I, I, I I like it. I wasn't probably buying it as much of that at that point. But, or, uh, or, or well, you could have, or you know what was what was always kind of cool was the uh, was the John Romita Wolverine where he actually had the whiskers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know if people know what to make of that if they see it drawn. Accurately. Yeah, well, you, I mean, you you went with more of the burn, right? You toned down the yellow in the browns. You went more with the browns. Well, Burn redesigned the outfit, uh, I think, after 1980, and when he came out with the brown outfit. I thought, oh my God, that's perfect. That is exactly what the character design should be because I never understood the multiple red, blue, and yellow colors for this character. I mean, he's kind of a werewolf superhero in a way, and it made no sense to me that he would be so vibrant. You know, like he also should have a little bit of a stealth capability, and, you know, that's just not happening when you're wearing bright yellow in the jungle. Yeah, and, and it's, it's cool that it's, I mean, as much as, People don't seem to to uh, to think of it as oh, th there's no difference. It's like there's a huge difference between some of the movie versions and the you know the classic versions you're talking about, especially with Cap. So it was cool that you stuck with just probably the most iconic uh, Jack Kirby, you know, Captain America versus giving him a you know giving him an army helmet and giving him some of those you know and and the movie stuff you know it works for the movie but I, I, you can't touch the kirby stuff when it comes to original cap with the with the dragons what is it the scales well the feeling i've always had is that the movies are going to be with us and then possibly same characters will get recast at some point and they'll do an update with that just like they've done with multiple other movie series. We've had up like three different versions of Spider-Man by this point. Right. And, you know, you're going to have that always happen. Whereas the comics history, it was their first and it has the biggest footprint. And when you see merchandise of these things get out there, it's largely based upon that formative style version of these things. So I try and embrace that. But that also represents the fact that I'm a middle-aged man reflecting what I grew up reading and this is what I was most attached to. So, you know, trying to be truly inclusive of the next wave of new designs is something that I'll grow to do more of over time, probably, you know, but a lot of it is to just represent the thing that I feel touched my life. And I, I agree with the design aesthetics of, and I want to feature that at least on alongside a lot of the contemporary things. Yeah, I'm, I I think you know it would be cool to see Man Thing in there next time. <laughs> man, <laughs> wow! Although okay. although I don't th I don't think I've seen you paint Man Thing except in like group shots. You yeah, know, like yeah. Every, He's I been think in your a your, your seventies Marvel piece was the only was was the last time we saw him, right? I mean, you've done Swamp Thing, but I don't remember a lot of Man Thing. Yeah, no, I um I never quite understood Man Thing his his appeal or, or, so or, well you, you, that's you not one for with, me you group him with brother voodoo it kind of comes together <laughs> i'd rather draw him in a way brother you know? voodoo, yeah so, it, so to tell me us i that, get that costume for whatever so then, reason so then me. as as it started to progress you, you how did the abrams thing come about the book the poster book the sizing and the, the, your your choice of you know format and everything uh well i mean we were talking about it for a while of doing this poster book and uh they had a series of other poster books they'd done previously but uh, i was able to work with them extensively in making this a very ambitious package because it's printed on a really heavy cardstock with uh, a real nice gloss sheen on the uh the figures so that you know each each figure each painting jumps out very nicely and um and also keeping the size of everything consistent. So it's a, a book where you don't have the figure sizes change with each page. 
it's all belongs together but also we printed a poster inside yeah that you have of everything assembled just like the mural is so uh it kind of has it all in one with this package and also uh i wrote extensive notes uh more or less like a term paper on each character as far as what i saw for the version i did of them what my impressions of them are and these are all positive things that i was sharing as far as inside of what i thought about the character and maybe particulars of what i thought i could bring to it in terms of the way i envisioned them i'm not redesigning anybody in here but there's a lot that you can do with the way you um you just render a shade of color yeah and it's cool that in the book you get you get the contrast you, you know you get them as a whole and you get the prelims and you show your process and then you get them separately and i think it, it was it's it's cool to see them to allow them to see them together but also to let them breathe a little bit to see each piece individually you know to where like you said it's on there each piece is on a white background and you can kind of and i think they come out right i mean they're made to come to there's a scoring yeah. of them they're made to so i know a lot of people have talked about hey can i pull the book apart and i'm like well i wouldn't but hey you know, <laughs> it's designed to be apart. able to pull these out of there the glue is the such that you you pull out the pieces without any rips or tears so all right so if you want to hang you know any of them around or even frame them i mean they're frameable it's like you said it's great paper i mean yep. it's a good kind of paper so but uh, i think that about covers it right was there anything yep. else you wanted to you know touch on for the uh show it one last time yeah again. It's, so, it's a pretty impressive pro, you know, and it's available through Abrams and it's on Amazon and everywhere else now. It's it's doing really, really well. People are loving it. Oh, the surfer, I gotta say, is my favorite. I mean the surfer. Pretty, wow. Well, it just just the reflective nature of it just seems like it was it was a ton of work and there was a lot of you know, a lot went into it. I mean, I could be wrong, but uh well, Colossus too, probably, because they they really jones over your reflective. Uh, effect that you get with the reflective nature of the armors and things like that you know the truth of stuff like that where it's painting chrome is that i always make sure i get the reference of a real chromed object which since they've made toys with that metallicized finish um i've been using that as a reference tool for the last 30 years ever since they started to make actual silver server silver surfers <laughs> real silver silver surfer toys uh, I could photograph that with whatever things I wanted to reflect or just really getting in there to accurately draw what would be like a mere finish on a human body. And I've applied that to illustrations of Iron Man and then same with Colossus. And in the case of Colossus, there's also a really nice uh, Bowen statue they did with a metallic finish that's uh, been a reference tool for me for a really long time. Yeah, and it's... it's, it's let's not forget the X-Men, you know, you got a, you got a nice, a really cool collection of X-Men and Beast turned out really well too, man. Oh, Beast, nice. Beast. You know, that, that it's interesting that period of X-Men that you chose, you know, that I, I think it was what, cause those are your favorite costumes, right? That whole period of Cockrum and. Yeah, I wanted to, I mean, the, the book itself is dedicated to Dave Cockrum because all the designs he did between DC and Marvel and in particular on the X-Men makes him one of the most, you know, talented, um, most important graphic designers in comic history, as well as one of the most appreciated artists for all the work he did. Um, and the way he designed these seemingly crazy outfits with a lot of shoulder pads pointed off, or, right. you know, like Colossus and Nightcrawler have, um, you know, he designed Phoenix. He, um, he made this group of characters the most stylish, and the most forward-looking group of superheroes in comics, where we're still going back to these same designs that he did 45 years ago today. So um, I also, I was happy to get to do, uh, when the piece expanded in the number of figures I was including for it to make uh, the, fit the wall for Marvel, um, I realized getting past just the initial most popular X-Men would allow me to then throw in the original lineup of, you know, Iceman, Beast, Angel, because, you know, normally you'd always get Cyclops and Jean Grey thrown in there. 
And I'm glad I got to do all those original guys because to me, they're all icons. Yeah. You know, these are the characters that Jack Kirby created. And I figure, you know, I want to get everybody represented uh, instead of just the new X-Men, which I appreciate as well. But, you know, it's it's always nice to have that, you know, collection of all of them thrown out there. Yeah. And the Hawkeye piece. Let's not forget Hawkeye. <laughs> Hawkeye. Because, well, but, well, because, you know, Hawkeye, you know, kind of gets lost in the movies that he just like he's, he's just a guy with a bow and arrow. Whereas comic fans and people in the comic, we grew up in comics like we did. That's a great outfit, man. That purple outfit is uh, I don't know who designed it. It goes all the way back to Kirby, right? Or Don Hack or uh, it might have been Kirby's design. But uh, I mean, Don Hack would have been the first guy to draw it for sure. And he yeah. did that in the pages of Iron Man. So. Um, I always look back at the original work that Heck did because there's a little bit more detail in there. Like you really get a sense of the chain mail effect of what he's got in the suit. And right. you get a sense of how this is like a uh, middle age, middle ages kind of graphic design thrown into a contemporary culture. So there's a reason he looks the way he does. Um, but obviously every time they update them, they throw in more contemporary features. And then now we mostly get rid of the mask, but man, I love that mask. Yeah. No, it's very cool. I mean, and it's, uh, it's almost like, um, it didn't, it hasn't, and it didn't change much through the Avengers either. That's the irony. Normally, my God, everybody changed. And, you know, even there's nobody I could think of that hadn't changed, but that if you look at Hawkeye all the way through the semi years and everything, it was the same Hawkeye. Yeah, it really, it was one of those characters that's only really changed since the Ultimate series came out in the 2000s. Right. Right. Uh, once they gave him a pair of sunglasses and said, like, that's enough. Right. No more mask. Right. Um, everybody's been trying to copy that. And I always, every time I get a chance to draw the character the way he looked, I try and sort of beef it up to say it's not like a crazy vibrant purple like you walk around and this guy is like man he's purple right, but it's, right. it's more subdued it's not the kind of thing that would kick you in the face it's more like somewhat subdued maroonish kind of purplish color yeah it's, yeah you know a little yeah. bit more earthy you know yeah no it's it's you know some of them catch you off guard man you know but like i said the response to them is always i never know where it's coming from but the, the Punisher and Ghost Rider and, and, you know, the Beast. And it's cool that the, you got the FF together. You know, you got, you know, thing with the trunks, even though he went through a lot of different, you know, jumpsuits and boots and John Byrne outfits. It's cool that he's just back to the trunks, you know. And that's also one of those characters that goes through the, you know, the critique of like, well, how big is he expected to be? Because in the FF, he actually wasn't, taller than everybody else right you know he was more the size of a normal guy just a bit thicker and so that's why when he would face off against the hulk the hulk was genuinely like seven feet tall and a whole head taller than him and uh, yeah you know they they kind of these days they make him much bigger which i'm fine with i just always try and do something that feels and looks as much like the shape of the kirby design as i can do yeah i, I can remember even some of the earliest ff cover where i think the first time they they're up against each other i don't know not not the cover where they're in the cavern and they're kind of walking towards each other but the other one where you can genuinely see they're not the same size even though people would always think oh they're you know they're kind of even stevens like no nah, man the hulk was always much bigger so it's yeah cool well they always the suit, you know kirby was always flexible in the way he did the hulk so sometimes the hulk could seem really small and i remember some some of those early issues that he did there's some drawings in where the Hulk's head's enormous. It's like the size, it's like four human heads would fit inside right. one head. How much, so a lot of that was with it, when Ditko was in him, right? I mean, the, the earliest stuff when he... Uh, you know, Ditko inked like the, or he drew this second issue, I want to say. And then right. uh, I, a lot of the stuff, I want to say, was Dick Ayers inking right. most of them. But uh, that's what my favorite is always when Dick Ayers was doing that stuff in the early 60s. It always sort of grounded Kirby's work and made it feel even more realistic to me. Well, it's good stuff, man. And, and right. you know, <laughs> I think that's about it, right? Okay. I mean, I think unless there's anything else you wanted to touch on, I think we hit it all. Okay. Well, hopefully there's 
enough <laughs> enough here to satisfy anybody's interest and that they I, will bother I, to go I think they got and what they buy need. the book. I, yeah, as long as it... it, it...